All right, we're at 11.32. I think it's a great time to start. Thank you for joining us. My name is Carl Frank. I'm the president of a &I Financial Services. Well, we only work with a small number of successful families and help you grow and protect your investments and choose how you want to be taxed. I am so excited about today's presentation. We've learned a lot uh, since we put this together at the beginning of the year. The whole world has changed. Presidential politics have changed. And we're excited to share with you some of the things we've learned. So. Uh, thank you for joining us. We are recording this, so a few rules of the road. Um, please go ahead and put yourself on mute and, and stop your video for now. Uh, at the end of the presentation, you can unmute yourself and, and turn on your video and we can have a more conversational dialogue, but we are going to record this and we'd like to put this on our web in our new Lunch and Learn video library. If you haven't been there, please check that out and uh, and enjoy it. You'll see, uh, we're gonna start to record all of our Lunch and Learns and we recorded several of them recently and you might enjoy them. Uh, so again, uh, keep yourself on mute. If you do have any questions, you may ask them as we go through the chat box. Uh, if you don't know how to mute yourself or turn off the video, it's in the bottom gray bar or black bar in the left-hand corner of your screen. And uh, Brett has control of that a little bit. Uh, he will go ahead and, and start muting everybody and turning a video if you happen to have it on. Uh, but you always have control, so you can interject. Uh, please don't for now, because we are recording it. We'd like to put it on the web and keep everybody private. All right, well, a little bit about us. We are one of the, uh, you know, I've never had a better group of people that I've ever worked with uh, than the group we have today. So thank you for joining us. Uh, our firm is a 34-year-old firm founded in 1986. We have more than 100 years of combined experience. Uh, we put together an expert team for you, and, and so uh, we're an independent firm, but we help you find a CPA, an attorney, insurance expert, lender, a business broker, whoever it is that you need for your unique situation. We put together the team, and we've got a process to help that team communicate. So you can ask your financial advisor here at a &I Financial any question, and we have the resources to go out and find it for, for you so that you can make your life more simple and more elegant. And, uh, and we appreciate you sharing that good story uh, with your friends and family. Uh, we have a patented investment process that's very unique to us. We're very proud of that. That, that makes us a, a unique. We only work with a small number of successful families, like I said. Uh, but mostly, you know, we're, we're, the final line there is that we're humble and we remain with a spirit of gratitude. So, so this group of people is, like I said, my favorite group of people that I've ever worked with, and, and I feel blessed to be a part of it. Uh, our speakers today will be... Brett Eberhardt. Uh, Brett is a retirement income planning and social security expert for our firm. Uh, Chad Harmon. Chad is also a retirement income planning expert for the firm. And Stacy Frank, uh, my wife, who specializes in financial advice for women. Uh, the four of us are the partners for the firm. And so we have a lot at stake at getting this right. And we are super excited uh, to talk to you today about presidential elections and Oh my goodness, what an amazing world we're living in. I'm not exactly sure if uh, the video stopped for you for a second there, I apologize if it did, but we should be back, there we are. So this slide is the first one I wanna talk about, myths and truths. And you know, if you're an American, you've got a strong political opinion likely, and, and half of us are one way, half of us are the other way. This grid tries to lay it out. And, you know, the presidential election is a big one, and the decision has important impacts. And we're reminded of that all the time. So that's not what I'm, uh, I'm the message that I want to deliver you today is something quite different from the importance of actually voting. Of course, we, we hear that all the time, but how that might affect your investments. And this grid lays it out. This is from Athena Invest. And you'll see in the, in the columns, you'll see the Congress. And so we'll either have a Congress that's Democrat or a Congress that's Republican or mixed right down the middle. And so there's three columns there. And then the horizontal rows here are describing the president. And so the president is either gonna be Democrat or Republican. And, you, and, and the number that you see there are the average annualized rates of return for the S&P 500 back to 1950 until the most recent complete calendar year under that situation. So the blue circle on the top left says if we have a Democratic Congress and a Democratic president, the average annualized rate of return is 14%. It's really good. And if you have a Republican president and a Republican Congress, the average is 16%. And then every other combination that you see on the screen is the average analyzed rate of return. And you'll see they're all pretty good. And so that's very important because the CEOs of the companies we're investing in, the people who are actually doing the work 
at the companies we're investing in, they all have political opinions and they all may vote a different way. And some companies even get pigeonholed into a certain type of company that, that might favor a certain uh, political party or another party, right? And all that might be true, but the one thing that unites all of them is that all the companies we're invested in, these small number of successful companies, uh, are here to make money, and they're going to find ways to be profitable regardless of the outcome of the election. And that's a very important thing to, to remember, that the companies that we're investing in are nonpartisan. They themselves might be comprised of people who have a big political belief one way or the other, and, and sometimes these people make the news. And some companies will benefit under a, demo, of a particular administration more than another company might benefit under that administration. But the companies, and so that might change the way that some of our money managers invest. But the bottom line is that the economy as a whole and the S&P 500 that you see right here delivers good rates of return of regardless of who's in office. And it might change the way we invest, but the returns themselves, the, the big average of it uh, doesn't change. And, and so that's the first slide that I, and the first thought I want you to think about that, yes, they have a big effect, these elections, but not perhaps in the way that you think. And that's going to be a recurring theme uh, for the rest of today's presentation. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Brett. Thank you, Carl. Let me see if I can show my face here. And let's do that. I want to talk a little bit before I get into my slide. I want to talk about this mixed column. Uh, just yesterday, I received a report from Zach's Investment Management that shows some research from Stratagas Research. And this mixed column was pretty interesting in that it shows that if a Democratic president has a Democratic Senate and a Republican um, House of Representatives, their returns over the last since 1933 through last year is 13.5. Now, if we go to a Republican president with a Republican Senate and a Democratic House, their returns since 1933 through last year is 13.5. So that gives you kind of a little bit of an idea that it's more, the, as Carl just said, the companies that make the big difference. Now, what we've done here is we've gone back to 1957 to show pretty much how the stock market has performed and how the, um, how the economy has done via, you know, the gross domestic product growth during these pre presidential terms. And in essence, what we're seeing is over this time frame, the return has been approximately 11% over the past 75 years. The economy's grown at, a, at an average of about 3%. Now, you will notice down on the left, there's a couple of presidents who didn't do so well, and that's not really an effect of their presidency, but rather that there were some financial crises during that time. In Nixon, back in the early 70s, there was a recession due to stagflation. You know, what that means is that it's a stagnant economy and high inflation. Um, that caused a bit of a recession back in his term. And we all remember 2008 it, with George Bush with our, you know, with the big financial crisis there. But in essence, what you can see is that they're all kind of scattered around and they're all doing, you know, the market has done pretty well regardless of who was in, who was in power. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about history right now. Sometimes when we think back about different presidents, in, you know, in the past, you know, we have a, a perception of what was going on. The first one I want to talk about is going to be Jimmy Carter. Now, Jimmy Carter, you know, had a bunch of policies and you really thought that maybe that there wasn't going to be a whole lot of significant job growth. But if we look at what actually happened during his tenure, you can see that the job growth was actually above what that average trend line since World War II is. All of these charts I'm going to show you will have a dark blue line, which is the trend since uh, World War II for this particular um, category. In this case, we were talking about jobs, Jimmy Carter, and job growth. Now, if we go to the next person, uh, Ronald Reagan, a lot of people were worried that we might not see much income because of the trickle-down policies that he had at that time. 
But what you're going to see here is that there was actually about a 20% growth rate in, in weekly income um, for the 50th percentile of the country. So, you know, again, something that you might have thought the facts prove that it might have been just the opposite. Now we'll go to um, Barack Obama. A lot of people thought with all of, you know, there might be wild inflation going on during his tenure with all the programs he was trying to start. But lo and behold, you'll see that the consumer price index was well below the trend line. So, you know, Barack, did, you know, is thought of maybe causing all of this inflation when in fact that wasn't true. And lastly, we'll talk about Donald Trump. Donald Trump, with, you know, with the, all of the, um, you know, the corporate tax breaks that were given, you'll see that it didn't have a big impact one way or the other on what was going on as far as capital expenditures from companies. So just beware, you know, what you think might be out there, sometimes the facts might just prove it a little bit differently. Now this is an interesting chart and one that I really want you to take to heart is if somebody were to invest clear back, you know, 120 years ago and just started investing and they just didn't care about what was going on politically, look at that gray line. Look how much money they would have as they, if they just stayed fully invested over those periods. Now for people that are worried or very, or very partisan investors, Look at, the, look at the rates of return that those people have had over the last 120 years. These are people that would only invest if their party was in, was in power. So you can see those that actually were staying invested, didn't care so much about the, the parties that were running it for their investments, um, that they did much better than those that align their investments with the particular party that's in power. So now I'm going to turn it over to Stacy and let her uh, give you some further facts as we go through here. Thanks, Brett, for providing that historical context for us. Uh, before I begin, I think it's uh, a great time just to take a breath. I mean, as a as a country right now, we're really in a collective state of anxiety. We're all navigating the pandemic, there's a lot of uncertainty, and we're in the middle of a very contentious presidential election. So I'm here to, to talk a little bit about some of the data that helps us maybe feel a little bit more calm and, uh, um, and helps us sleep a little better at night as we go through this election season. So you might be wondering, you know, what will happen, you know, with spending under our next uh, president? You know, what if something um, changes in the way that we we spend money as a country that just radically re-engineers the U.S. economy? And I want to reassure you, you know, looking over the last, you know, 70 years or so, we've implemented many large spending initiatives uh, under many different presidents with um, many different, with different political parties. And in spite of all these major spending initiatives, really the consumer spending is remarkably consistent as a percentage of our overall GDP, as is business investment and as our government uh, expenditures. Just wanna get feedback. Are you all having a little bit hard time hearing me? Okay, let me know Keith if that continues. That sounds um, so good, I really wanna reassure you. Okay, thanks. So I'd like to reassure you that um, even with major spending initiatives on the table or potential spending initiatives that really looking at the long term, our spending is remarkably the same and is not radically re-engineered the way the U.S. economy operates. So next, you, know, you might be asking, well, you know, what if under our next president, you know, we do make some major changes and you know what will happen with the stock market and i'm really uh, here to give you some good news about that in spite of these major initiatives changes in the way that we're spending our money as a country um, the dow jones has continued to ratchet up um, at an annualized rate of return of a little over 10 percent over you know almost 100 years so we really have a lot of historical um, confidence and we can take 
take a little bit of you know worry off the table in terms of uh, different spending initiatives, you know, really radically uh, changing up the stock market. Look at uh, welfare uh, reform, uh, for example, in the 1990s, President Clinton radically re-engineered the way uh, welfare worked um, as it was initially established, you know, with uh, Medicare and Medicaid. And it's, you know, that doesn't even create a blip, you know, really when we look at this long-term historical trendline of the Dow. So next, I'll talk a little bit about how signature legislation may or may not uh, change things and may or may not change uh, things the way we expect them to do. Uh, now, when we have a, a new president or an existing president that's reelected, what we would anticipate uh, as a country is for the president to um, implement a major sort of signature legislation as the mark of the presidency. So this historically is what happens. So I'll give you two examples of different parties uh, and both in our recent memory. Uh, so we'll start with Obama. And as we all know, uh, he implemented the Affordable uh, Care Act. And one big concern over the Affordable Care Act was that this would just destroy hiring for small uh, for small companies with um, with 50 employees or more. And the reason uh, that folks were concerned was that employees with 50 or more people would now have to either pay for health care or, or, or pay a penalty. Um, but in reality, this really had a different effect when we look at uh, the, the point at which the Afford Affordable uh, Care Act was signed into action in 2010 um, up to current time. Uh, we really see a, a market increase in the number of uh, employees hired uh, from that group of businesses. And we see uh, the system of checks and balances at work here. Uh, right after the Affordable Care Act was signed, you know, just a few months later, uh, the Republicans won majority again in the House of Representatives, and we see our system of checks and balances. Uh, it works um, slowly uh, sometimes, um, but it does generally keep things on an even keel. So now let's look at an example uh, from Trump. His major uh, signature initiative was the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. Well, what was the expected result of this? We thought that uh, with the tax incentives uh, for businesses, that, that businesses would start to place a lot of new orders for capital goods because there were um, big tax incentives for doing so. But when we look at the actual a trend line, it's very stable and static. Um, you know, we can remember that slide back in Brett's presentation too, that the spending is actually um, a bit lower after this, uh, this act was established. And again, similar to looking at Obama's signature initiative, uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was signed uh, in 2017, and less than a year later, Democrats won majority in the House of Representatives, again, showing us how that system of checks and balances does work over long periods of time. So with that, hopefully you can rest just a little bit easier, and I will um, pass the presentation over to Chad. All right. Well, thank you, Stacy. I appreciate it. I hope everyone's holding up okay. Um, so I know everybody on the call is waiting for us to, to rub our crystal ball here and tell you what's going to happen with the markets, um, depending on, on how November 3rd goes. And, and in reality, our industry has always resisted making market predictions based off the results of presidential elections. And, and why is that? Why won't we put ourselves out there? Well, it's because those predictions tend to be wrong. Um, in the past 10 years have been an interesting case study as we've had two different administrations with radically different platforms experience very similar returns in the stock market. Um, I think it's important for all of us to understand that our, our conventional narratives um, on candidates' stated policies are often misguided. Um, I'll use an example. Uh, back in 2008, when Barack Obama was trying to push through the Affordable Care Act, it was going to be the end of healthcare stocks as we know it. Um, what actually happened was healthcare stocks achieved over 15% annualized return during Barack's time in office. Very different than what everybody thought. In fact, the healthcare sector kept pace with the broader U.S. Uh, financial markets. Um, you'll see in the bottom left that growth stocks under Obama's term outperformed their value counterparts. Um, and it was a meaningful amount. 
However, um, this is a very far cry from what people thought President Trump's policies were going to do, which was going to come in and re start raising real yields, steepening the yield curve, and unlocking the true value in the market. Um, but it turns out value stocks have not received the catalyst that they needed to outperform. Uh, in the bottom right of the screen here, you'll see that that gap in performance between growth stocks and value stocks has actually widened dramatically under the Trump administration. Um, and although we thought interest rates were going to start creeping up um, under Trump, you'll see that on the top chart, uh, the 10-year nominal US, uh, the nominal US 10-year yield has actually been lower under President Trump than it was under Barack Obama. All right. All right, so for all the focus we're putting on the executive branch, maybe we should be looking at something different if that's not the best indicator. And what we think is that monetary policy actually matters a lot more than who's sitting in the Oval Office. Um, I'm going to take a minute to make sure we understand what we're looking at here. The yellow line on the screen is not indicative of the movement of the stock market. What the yellow line represents is financial conditions in the United States going back um, over the last 30 years. And when that yellow line is going down, it means that financial conditions in our country are easing. An example of that would be uh, with monetary policy, with the central banks lowering um, the federal funds rate, that is going to pump money into the economy and stimulate growth. That would be an example of what's going on when the yellow line is on the decline. When that yellow line is increasing, that means that we're tightening our financial policy. And the takeaway here is that over the last 30 years, when we look at the three largest periods of easing financial conditions, look at the return that the stock market has provided, you know, twice over 200%, and in the middle there, almost 100% return in a very short period of time. Um, some presidents have been helped by this. Some presidents have been hurt by this. I'll give a few examples. Um, both Reagan and Clinton benefited tremendously from consistently falling interest rates over their tenure, uh, whereas the Bushes were the opposite. Both George Sr. and George W. were hurt by Fed tightening. Um, Pre President Obama actually benefited from more of a benign rate environment, um, minus a brief stint you know, at the end of 2015 into 2016. And then President Trump, um, some would say, was hindered by uh, more of a, a tightening of financial uh, policy during the first two years um, he was elected from 2016 into 2018. So um, the, key, uh, the key here is that markets have done well during periods of easing financial conditions. So the old adage is holding true, don't fight the Federal Reserve, okay? Um, if you're curious what the Fed is doing today, currently um, they're providing support, but they don't intend to decrease interest rates meaningfully moving forward. Um, we're expecting the current interest rate environment to remain um, relatively sl stable with a, a slight increase in the yield curve or interest rates starting to increase slowly over time. Um, and would expect it to be a fairly benign environment for stocks. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next slide here. Uh, I know that conservative speaker Ben Shapiro uh, has gotten popular as of late for a phrase he coined, which was, facts don't care about your feelings. And uh, I think what he may, may want to change that to is the market doesn't care about our feelings. And so the good news for today, for those that are frustrated with how things are going in our country, investors do not have to love what's going on in Washington, D.C., to prosper from the financial markets. Um, what this uh, chart is, is demonstrating is uh, over the last 60 years, the, the Gallup polls for the presidential approval rating, going back for both Republican and Democratic candidates. And the takeaway that I got from this is that rarely do we all agree. Um, it, it's very rare for more than two thirds of the country to hate what's going on in Washington. You'll see that that only happens about 6% of the time. Conversely, it's almost just as rare for all of us to agree that they're doing a great job. You know, a little over 10% of the time, um, two thirds majority of our country is in favor uh, and has a positive rating of the president, regardless of, of party. Most of the time we're living in the fat middle, okay? And some of the best returns the market has ever provided are when the president's approval rating are actually lower, between 36 and 50%. And that's demonstrated in the, the gray bar running across the screen here. So to state that another way, um, 
the markets delivered some of its most exceptional returns during periods when more than half of America disapproves of the job that the current administration is doing. Um, I will leave you with this, that it, it's hard to find any direct relationship between the popularity of the president, the strength of the economy, and the future performance of the financial markets. So there's a lot of pundits out there. Everybody's got their own opinion on what's going to happen with the election. And I'll throw a few out there um, that have been brave enough to make their opinion. I'll start, I'll start with uh, billionaire Mark Cuban, um, who back in 2016 said that if Donald Trump wins, it's going to tank the market. Um, turns out the result of that was one of the strongest economies you know, the, the America has ever seen, you know, pre-COVID. Um, another economist, uh, Michael Boskin, thought that President Obama's policies were going to be the death of the Dow. Um, that is not what we saw under the Obama administration. We had a tremendous run-up in the market. So the, uh, the dire predictions of disappointed voters uh, often tend not to come true, something we need to, we need to all remember. Um, so if we can't focus on, on who wins the election in a month, what can we focus on? And one option here is what's called the misery index. Um, it's the goldish line on the top half of your screen here, and it's comprised of unemployment plus inflation. And historically, uh, this has been a, a really strong indicator of what's going to happen in the upcoming election. Um, when the misery index is on the rise, the incumbent party has tended to lose the election. Okay, you'll see that over and over throughout decades of history here. It's been pretty darn reliable. When the misery index is on its way down, which is what we've seen since 2016, it would lead us to believe that the current administration is in good shape going up to November. Now, it, I would be uh, uh, not be prudent to not point out what you see on the very far right of your screen here, which is the effects of coronavirus um, on our country and shutting down the economy. When we shut down the economy, unemployment spiked, and you'll see that the misery index actually increased to its highest rating it's been in 40 years. So for all the Democrats on the call today, it looks like Trump has finally got his wall built there. Um, it's looking good for you in a couple weeks if we're, if we're using this as our predictor. Um, for all the Republicans on the call, I want you to know that moving forward, um, this spike that we've seen in the misery index is actually going down just as quickly as it began. So who knows what that's going to mean on November 3rd. Um, definitely interesting information, though, and I think we've all got a different way that we'll, we'll take the information um, coming off of this chart. So regardless of who we favor, you know, don't let uh, certain election indicators or even the result of the election disrupt your financial plan. When we're putting together these long-term plans, we're trying to account for a variety of economic conditions and stock market environments and want to make sure that we set you up to be successful regardless of who is sitting in the Oval Office uh, moving forward. I will close with a, a moment of levity. You know, vitriol has always been a part of our political pr process and our media. Um, if you turn on the TV, regardless of which station you're listening to these days, um, it sounds more like a war zone than anything else. And in fact, some of America's most staunch defenders of free press, some of the, the greatest heroes in our history, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, uh, were quoted expressing their extreme frustration of how they were portrayed uh, through the press at the time. Um, in fact, one of the most infamous uh, duels in American history was actually the result of political disagreements. And so way back in 1804, on the, uh, the cliffs of Weehawken, Alexander Hamilton, who was the, the former U.S. Treasury Secretary at the time, um, fought a duel with uh, Aaron Burr, who was the sitting VP. So I want you to think of Steve Mnuchin and VP Mike Prince, uh, Mike Pence, actually battling it out in a fight to the death, um, ultimately resulting in the death of, of Mr. Hamilton in this example. So tonight, as we all turn on our TVs, if you're tuning into the election, um, unless 
uh, Mike Pence and, and Kamala Harris, you know, pull out their sabers and, and break down their, their COVID approved plastic barriers and actually fight it out on stage, we're, we're actually maintaining a higher level of political discourse today than we have in the past. So hopefully that brings a smile to your face. Um, I hope that you had some great takeaways from the presentation today. I'm going to hand things back over to Carl and uh, we'll go ahead and kick off the, the Q&A. <laughs> Thank you, Chad. That is a fascinating statistic in the Hamilton play. Uh, if you've had a chance to see it, you know how it ends. And uh, that scene, of course, is amazing because, of course, the two of them used to be friends. Uh, let me summarize what we just discussed and, and kind of bring it to a close here. The, uh, the election is not the worst we've ever seen. And, and on the screen, you're going to see a whole bunch of definitions. We, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to uh, Invesco for putting together many of these statistics and Athena Invest. Uh, both of them did a, did a wonderful job. Here, here are the takeaways. Here's, here's what we've learned. And, the, and like we started out with, markets have done well under both political parties. The historical narrative is not the way we remember it. Investors are better off staying fully invested and not trying to time the market with a decision over what the political party may or may not be able to accomplish. We don't radically re-engineer the U.S. economy, even with some of the biggest legislation that Stacy mentioned. Uh, the economy rumbled along because of consumers, regardless of what the legislation may have intended to do. Uh, signature legislation accomplishments are, in, uh, accomplishments are infrequent, and the impact is not always as expected, which is what Brett was talking about with uh, some of the forecasts and some of the realities that shortly really followed. Predictions tend to be wrong. There's your bottom line. Model, monetary policy matters more. Don't fight the Fed. And you know what? It's okay if you don't like the president. The market doesn't care. Uh, don't confuse partisan politics with a market analysis. And finally, like Chad said, you know, this actually isn't the most vitriolic election. It, it's been much worse. Things are getting better as much as it might feel like the, sometimes the news and everything sets us back. Uh, progress is messy and things are getting better and they'll continue to get better over time. So I'm going to conclude there. I appreciate your attention. I'm so glad you joined us. Uh, feel free if you'd like to go ahead and uh, unmute yourself, turn on the video and, and ask any questions of us. Uh, we are all here for you and we are greatly thankful for your time.